Well, hello, Oddballs. It's your host, Bobby. And your co-host, Lexi. And this is Oddities Oddities on on Elm Street. Welcome back to episode 21. 21. Yeah, you'll be hearing this week 14. Oh boy. I can't believe it. So I wanted to do something a little different for our intro. I thought it'd be fun to share some morbid news from around the world. And if this is something that like people like to hear, then we can, you know, spice it up a little. Just a little bit. I feel like I always get really <coughs> awkward during the oh, intros. Same. Yeah. So. What you got? So, you got anything? Yes, I got a little tidbit for you. Mm, and it's actually local for us. Mm. And not super local, but someone at the Detroit Metropolitan Airport was caught with something very interesting in their bag. You want to take a guess? You're, you're not getting guess. Okay. <laughs> tell what you got. Mm. So this person was coming back to the States from an international place. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when you come back, like you have to go through customs. Mm-hmm. And sometimes at customs, they just like randomly pick a bag to go under the x-ray machine. So they select this person's bag for a random search. They run it under the x-ray machine and they find... Um, like a skull-like shape in the bag, okay? No. But they physically search the bag. And when they open it up, it is the skull of a dolphin. I What? It, it makes me wonder, like, where are they coming from? I don't know. Obviously, we don't have dolphins in Michigan. <laughs> So, uh, it's also very illegal, you know, you can't just like bring whatever the fuck you want from one place to another. One time I smuggled little baby crabs from Jamaica. Did you? Okay. Cause they were so cute. I wanted them. One time I smuggled <laughs> coral from Haiti <laughs> and then I got home and I was so excited to show everybody it smelled like a decomposing body oh in my God. suitcase. It was awful. <laughs> so bad. Whoa. Totally regret it. But yeah, like sometimes when you come back, you have to like fill out that little visa that you like have to tell them whether or not you have any like animal products yeah, I know. or whatever. I was like, Mm-mm. Yeah, I, I asked the lady next to me, I was like, would you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, just mark no. <laughs> okay (laughs) thankfully it wasn't searched but yeah so i guess they took the skull away and uh they're doing a little investigation on that so that's your little morbid tidbit for the week just interesting i don't i don't know that i'd want a dolphin skull it's uh it'd make a good conversation piece you're right but other than that i can't did he like get it confiscated yeah. Oh, yeah. They took it. Took that sheep or the Oh, they did. They probably got it in their house somewhere. So. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, ma'am. You're welcome. I I thought it was interesting, too. I have to keep <laughs> my eyeballs peeled. Yeah, you let me know. I do. I send you a lot of things on Reddit. And you, you do. And you don't often respond. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean I don't see it. It's usually just... I, I forget, you know, I get busy. <sighs> but yeah. Um, so I think we should just jump in. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter one, which is kind of sad because I know a lot of people comment saying they like the longer episodes. Me too. But it is an unsolved mystery. And people like those episodes, so it kind of makes up for it. I hope you like it. Hopefully. And the information we do have, even though it's not a lot, is really interesting and spooky. Mm -hmm. So just... Buckle up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the dragster. Quick, but whoo! Didn't the dragster get shut down? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Probably. I believe it. I think so. Mm. Yeah. Well. Oh, well. All right, so, so tell us, okay. Bob, 
Let's do it. Leroy Carter Jr., a man experiencing homelessness, lay down to rest one night in a sleeping bag like he had done every night before, but this time was different. Leroy's body would be found the next day without his head. Leroy Carter Jr. was born on September 17, 1951, in the state of Louisiana. His early life isn't very well documented, but we do know that in the 70s he served in the Marine Corps, his rank was a private first class, and he served in the Vietnam War. Upon his return to the U.S., he had a hard time getting back on his feet, as did a lot of veterans mm -hmm. during that time. So, unfortunately, he became a sort of transient and started living on the streets of San Francisco, California. While in San Francisco, he was arrested several times for petty crimes like stealing and loitering, but it became apparent that Leroy wasn't just some criminal that was doing these things just because he wanted to, more so that he was just trying to survive. On Saturday, February 7th, 1981, the day starts coming to an end and Leroy begins looking for a place to sleep. He settles on a spot in Golden Gate Park near Alvord Lake. It was a quiet spot and relatively secluded, so it would hopefully allow him to get a good night's sleep. As he laid out his sleeping bag, Leroy had no idea that he would become the victim of a gruesome murder. Several hours later, in the morning of Sunday, February 8th, San Francisco police officer James Doherty was called out to Golden Gate Park. A tan bag with blood spatter had been turned over to police by a young woman who found it in the park. After searching inside the backpack, police don't find anything suspicious, so they begin to look around the surrounding area from where the backpack was found. Officer Doherty begins combing through the park, focusing specifically around the area where the backpack was found. And he's basically just looking for any clue of a struggle. Mm -hmm. This backpack had blood on the outside of it, so... Yeah, you gotta investigate a little bit. Yeah. So they're hoping that they can find some sign of foul play somewhere, figure out what's going on. Still wrapped inside his sleeping bag, Officer Doherty finds Leroy Carter Jr. in a large pool of blood. Leroy had been brutally killed with his head severed from his body. In fact, his head was missing altogether. But it gets even stranger. Inside of Leroy's body, stuffed inside of the opening where his head and neck became separated, were two kernels of corn and a chicken wing jammed inside. About 50 yards away, they find the remains of a mutilated chicken. A more thorough search of the park failed to turn up Leroy's head or any murder weapons. The only way police were able to identify him were through his fingerprints. He was already in the database because of his... Of being a Marine. And... And yeah. the petty crimes. Yeah, okay. But yeah. Um, and from there, an investigator named Sandy Gallant was called in to help with the investigation of Leroy's murder. Sandy was kind of known as an expert on the occult. Mm -hmm. It was noted that Leroy's head seemed to have been separated from his body in a very precise way, almost as if it was done by an expert with a really sharp tool, like a machete or a sharp axe. <clears throat> uh, don't, 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 don't like that. that. No. And because of that, and so, like the objects that they found at the scene... It was speculated that this wasn't just any typical murder. This was thought to have been done in a sacrificial manner. A little side note. I was like, I want to say 11 or 12. And I was sitting on my bed one day in what's now the nursery. And <clears throat> I was listening to music on my iPod shuffle. Mm. 
with my headphones in. Love those days. Yeah. It was probably like Umbrella by Rihanna. I was obsessed <laughs> with that song. Anyways, so I was sitting on my bed. I didn't even know it was storming <clears throat> out. Um, Because like I said, I had my headphones and I'm mm-hmm. jamming out. Mm-hmm. I, for some reason, had this really weird feeling in my gut. And I left the room and when I closed the door... A tree had fallen on my room and poked through the roof. What did you do? Uh, <clears throat> I ran downstairs because I'm like, well, if any tree comes crashing in. At least the monsters least the- will save me. <laughs> Who is that? Your that- great aunt? <laughs> <laughs> my aunt Salem. <laughs> uh, no, but I call my dad. <clears throat> yeah, as one does. He was at work. And I don't, I don't remember, you know, you know, what? actually I do remember. I called my dad. He didn't answer. I called my mom and I did that repetitively and I was texting. Um, I was texting my middle school boyfriend. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm full <scared. laughs> So yeah, uh, I don't like <clears throat> storms that much. I like them because of the mood, mm-hmm. the ambiance. Mm-hmm. But I don't really like, like, if I'm here by myself or if I'm sleeping at night and I'm woke up, like, I'm, I'm playing out every scenario in my head of how a tree is going to fall on the house and I'm going to die. Oi. So. That sucks. Being at work in the big greenhouses when it's pouring is so cool. It sounds just so peaceful. All I want to do is just snuggle up Mm -hmm. in a blankie, Mm -hmm. take a nap. I'm like everything's fine. See the rain and the rain's fine, but when I hear the big booms <laughs> and the lightning, oh, it's also fun because then all the guys like stop for a second and we all like, it's like gonna collapse. <laughs> well, and when I was, um, I want to say like seventeen or eighteen, I worked for the road commission, mm-hmm. and my dad was on tree crew. So when trees would fall down in the road and stuff, he would have to go out. And one morning, it was really bad. Like our the power at the garage went out and everything, and every every worker was dispatched for tree removal, and that was scary shit. And I remember then at the end of the day, we got called to an accident. Sometimes we have to show up at accidents to investigate, like, the road conditions, mm. and it was a truck um, that had hit a tree that was in the road, and there was blood pouring out of the truck. Uh, thankfully I didn't see the guy. He was, he made it. He was fine. But his airbag, I think probably just fucking broke his nose or some shit. Cause there was a lot of blood. Oh, I... But yeah, I don't like that. But we've had, we've had a few, tr- mm-hmm. we've had, a- <laughs> we've had a few trees fall in the house. One right outside the living room got struck by lightning. Scared the shit. Oh God, that, that scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Did you, okay, did you hear growing up that you can't take a shower during a lightning yes. storm because it'll come through the shower? Yes. Is that true? I don't think so because I gave up on that a long time ago. All right, anyways, let's anyways. go back to this. Uh, so, yeah, they call uh, Sandy, Sandy Gallant. Sandy Gallant was the perfect person for the job. In fact, she had earned herself the nickname of Colt Cop. Since she was the police department's go-to gal for any cases suspected of involving the occult. She had previously been thrusted into the spotlight for her work related to the Jonestown murders. Which is a topic for a a whole whole other episode. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting, and I mean it probably has no meaning behind it, but I think it's interesting that Jim Jones, the founder of Jonestown, he had like a lot of ties in the San Francisco area. Mm. So, right. Who knows? Because they moved from California to, to Guyana. Okay. Yeah. So, because of her involvement with the Jonestown murders, Sandy had to study up on cults, brainwashing, and so called alternate religions. Mm-hmm. So, again, she's just the perfect person for this type of case. And while reviewing the details in the case of Leroy, Sandy noted similarities between his death and some sacrificial rituals performed in the religion called Santeria. 
Santeria is wild. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I, I, I got you. I got you. <clears throat> Do you have a crystal ball? I, I ain't got no crystal ball. <laughs> Do you have a million dollars? I, I spent it all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we're friends. <laughs> You just understand me. I do. I do. You know, honestly, though, this type of stuff really interests me. Yes, me too. I don't know what it is, but I'm just, like, drawn. And not drawn to, like, practicing these things, but I just want to know more. Well, it's it's so foreign to our white, washed, West Michigan way of life. Yeah, it really is. so interesting to know about. Yeah, I think that we should do an episode on, like... The Satanic Panic. Yes. And I mentioned that in here. So Santeria is a religion that has evolved out of the area of central Nigeria and has actually been in practice for over 500 years. I hope they can hear that. That is spooky. <laughs> Alrighty. That's what they got to say about that. Heard you loud and clear. <laughs> Jeez Louise. So, it's Santeria is thought to have been created by the Yarobi tribe, or Yoruba, I think is how you pronounce it. They at least practiced a belief that would eventually evolve mm-hmm. into Santeria. And that was spread through ships carrying African slaves to the so-called New World. So Sandy also looked into any other practices that could tie into black magic rituals, like Aztec practices, Haitian voodoo, satanic Mm, worship, mm -hmm. and even Catholicism. Hey. You gotta cover all your bases. You do. I think that's interesting, though. It is very, but like it all makes sense. It does, because you know, here West Michigan is it's very normal. It's just the way of life. But then, like, if you are an outsider looking at it, yeah, like there's a lot of weird shit. Yeah. Oh yeah, I agree with that. Like, if you're if you're not familiar with it, and then you're looking from like the outside in. You might see things that are that appear ritualistic for sure. It's all got magical shit involved. Yeah, parting the sea, walking on water. We should make it like a a religion segment. Yeah, like how we have like unsolved. Do like we should, yeah. or maybe do like minis on it too. Oh, like just focus on one at a time. Mm-hmm. I want to get into astrology too. That'd be interesting. I mean, that's a whole another. Mm-hmm belief system in itself i guess but right so yeah it's it's pretty rare for any religion to practice human sacrifice a lot of times people just use occult practice as an excuse to murder people Mm -hmm. and as a lot of us know the 80s brought the satanic panic yeah so everyone was freaked out about satanists they were all worried their kids would become devil worshippers because they were listening to Black Sabbath. Led Zeppelin. Robert Plant, man. <laughs> He's bad news. <laughs> Did you know I got to see him in concert? Ah, oh, fuck you. That is my whole, that made my whole life. Miller bought me tickets and surprised me. <laughs> I have the best husband ever. Shut up. I tell no, people that do. Robert Plant is my father, actually. I did a report on him in high school. Are you kidding me? No. This is so weird because nobody knows, like, who Robert Plant is. That's why you're my soul sister. Seriously, though, like, <laughs> that is so crazy. Like, since I was, I mean, I don't know, Led Zeppelin's my favorite band of all time. And I have, like, curly hair like Robert Plant. Mm-hmm. And so my parents and Miller, they all call me Robbie instead of Bobby. Yeah, isn't that funny? Oh, my God. Like, when my hair is stupid, crazy, frizzy, they all are like, okay, Robert. (laughs) That's that's so crazy to me that you even know who he is. I love you so much. I love Robert Plant. I love Robert Plant, too. What's crazy, too, is that 
my see this is why i tell people he's my father <laughs> i mean what, ken's not good enough because for one i have mental issues <laughs> but secondly my mother i tell everybody went into the led zeppelin concert and came out eight months pregnant with me she really did though i mean <coughs> not, she was pregnant with me before obviously because whatever but she spent her last cash on candy bars because she was pregnant and didn't have any money for parking, but the lady let them in anyways. And she stood on a chair while she was eight months pregnant with me Jesus to see him. Christ. Yeah. That's my origin story. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I love it. <sighs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, but Led Zeppelin and, you know, we've all heard the conspiracy of... You listen to mm -hmm. what is it, Stairway the Beatles to Heaven and backwards, yeah, and yeah. it's talking about Satan and well, and that's a whole nother story too because they they wrote music in um, a house owned by uh, a very God. What is his name? He's a very popular occultist, like the most popular in the world. Alexander, no, no, Mister, because that's the thing is. Ozzy Osbourne, the lead singer of Black Sabbath, has mm -hmm. a song about him, too. I think it's Mr. Mister Crowley. Mm. Mr. Crowley. Interesting. Alistair Crowley. That's I knew it was Alistair. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he is, like, known to be, um, like, a huge... I don't know if he's a Satanist or I don't, what. I, I know that I was... I, he's, like, into the occult, for sure. Yeah, I was looking on Audible at... <laughs> I just typed in Satanic Panic, and some books of his came up. Really? Yeah. I That's thought. interesting. Yeah. Maybe um, I'm just seeing things. Oh, no. The Book of the Law. Book of the Law. I'm so interested in this man. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I think Ozzy Osbourne, though, was a big one during this time because of the bat. Remember? Mm -mm. He bit a bat's head off and drank the blood on stage during mm. a concert. Mm. So, you know, people's kids are listening to that and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> what are we going to do? And then you have serial killers like Richard Ramirez saying, Hail Satan, during his trap. Like, that's literally how he said it. Hail Satan. Like, <laughs> he doesn't open his mouth when he talks and it irritates me. And then he shows, like, his hand with an upside down pentacle on it. Oh, yeah. Which isn't even satanic, really. But yeah, it's but just all for show. Unfortunately, we have people like Richard Ramirez who give those types of symbols a bad name. Mm -hmm. And they just don't even call it the right thing. It's not a pentagram. It's a pentacle, my friends. A pentagram is just a star. No need to be scared. Don't be scared of the star. It's okay. <laughs> Anyways, back to Leroy's case. I'm just buying a bunch of his books right now. <laughs> so get on get on Audible later. You'll see. I can't I can't when I'm home by myself. I'm already scared. What if I get scared and then st stuff starts happening? Because what's crazy too is I was looking into this case and they were going around like investigating other people who had um looked into like ritualistic cult killings mm -hmm. and there was one investigator and don't take my word verbatim but there was one investigator that was saying that his job kind of required him to look into like the satanic bible mm. stuff like that mm -hmm. and then he was saying that he was experiencing just like horrible things like he I don't remember, but his kid had, like, this really terrible infection for, like, nine months. And oh they tried, like, God. five different medications and it wouldn't go away. And then all of a sudden, like, just all these crazy things are happening. Like, just bad energy type stuff. And so, yeah. I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. It's like when I watched the um, exorcism of Emily, Emily Rose. Rose and I woke up for... Yeah. At um, 3 a.m. Like, every morning. Dot, yeah. To the point where I was, like... That's what I'm saying. Scared, but I think that stuff, like, gets in your head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It has a way of, like, <laughs> just, like, nagging <laughs> at your brain. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so, yeah. Um, 
Sandy has a strong suspicion that Leroy's murder is somehow associated with Santeria, but she doesn't really feel like she has a strong enough understanding of what Santeria actually is. Mm -hmm. So she reaches out to a man named Charles Wetley, or Wetly. Should have looked that up, you know. Charles worked as a coroner in Florida, but he's considered one of the leading experts on Santeria in the United States. Which is kind of interesting mm-hmm. that he's working as a coroner. When Charles looked into Leroy's murder, he also said that it bore the resemblance of human sacrifice. And then feeding off from Sandy's theory that this could be a type of Santeria-based ritual, he realized that the ritual was likely not yet complete. I, f- I feel like people would probably be wondering, like, why specifically the head? Well, why the corn? <laughs> why the yeah. wing? Oh, there's so many you know? questions that, because, like, you know, if you're not practicing these things, then you don't have any understanding of why. You're not, yeah. What's you, the point? You have no idea. And I only know this because I've looked into um, Mark Kilroy. Mm. Which again, mm-hmm. another case for mm-hmm. another time, and that that one's fucked up. But the head can usually it's used to create some kind of like ritualistic brew. Mm. That sounds so awful. Uh, using parts of the brain and possibly even like the eyes and the ears of the victim. Um, what is the brew supposed to do? Give you anything you want, I think, because what they did to Mark Kilroy is basically the same as far as like making a brew out of his head. Their cult leader convinced them that they had to do that in order to be successful in the drug smuggling. What the fuck was that? Oh, wow. <sighs> So, yeah, I, you were asking why they would do that with the Mark Kilroy case. The cult leader was trying to, he was trying to convince them that if they did that, and I think they ate pieces of him, if I'm not mistaken, then they would be successful in their drug smuggling business. So. That's nasty. Yeah. I always think of fucking our friend. Our high school friend who asked us <laughs> when we when we die if she could try a little bit of us. Yeah, that should have been a red flag, but we're just so weird that we're like, like ah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I feel like any normal person would have been like, I'm going to block your number. <laughs> we're like, that so was, uh, FYI, maybe take a step back here. And look at your life if one of your friends is asking if they can just try a little piece of you after you're gone. And this wasn't somebody that was like... A West, West Memphis 3 type of... Yeah, she was she was very like normal. Going to med school. <laughs> oh, maybe that's why. <laughs> We've connected the pieces. <laughs> yeah. So, Sandy later went on to tell... The L.A. Times, quote, at the end of those 21 days, if the priest deemed it appropriate, he would actually sleep in an area with this head and with this cauldron for another 21 day period. Then on the 42nd day, he discards the head in close proximity to where he took it from. To him, that was a sacred way of returning the head. Like, what? So if her theory proved true, then Leroy's head would be returned, right? Yeah. 42 days later. Yeah. After, like, you're sleeping with it? Yeah, I don't know what that's all about, but... Can't imagine the smell. Yeah. So she pretty much presents this theory to Uh her team, Uh and she's laughed at. They pretty much told her, quote, this stuff doesn't happen. And so her, you know, 
what she believed might happen pretty much just fell on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. But she even later admitted that it was even hard for her to believe that that was something that would actually happen. But 42 grueling days went by with still no answer for what happened to Leroy Carter Jr. Sandy and her partner returned to the scene of the crime, Golden Gate Park, which is so crazy to me because it was literally just by happenstance that they were there that day, exactly 42 days after the death. And I feel like she hadn't really put much thought behind that theory of Uh like, oh, well, in 42 days, his head should be here, so let's go to the park. After you're laughed at by all of your coworkers and boss, like, I'm going to maybe withdraw a little bit from that. Yeah. But that's so crazy to me. Like, it's like... uh, Maybe her subconscious. Yeah, maybe. I think that's so interesting, though, that she had, like, this gut feeling Mm -hmm. and kind of, like, pushed it away. But it's almost, like, resurfacing. Like, no, you need to listen to me. Right. So, when Sandy arrived at the park on this day, she noticed some newspaper reporters coming and going around the surrounding areas. They were kind of, like, staked out, waiting for something to happen, hoping to catch something. Mm -hmm. But there weren't any police set up to monitor that area of the park where Leroy's body was found because, again, nobody believed Sandy's theory. And so it's like, why would they waste the time and the resources Mm -hmm. to set up surveillance? But it was the disbelief in Sandy's theory that would cause this case to remain unsolved because there, placed in the weeds next to the water along Alfred Lake, was the decomposing head of Leroy Carter Jr. So, like how hard would it have been to even have one or two just like keep an eye on the area? Yeah, it's one day. It's not like the uh that just shows Atlanta child murder or that they're spending months looking and searching and staking out right one fucking day that just shows how jesus that was a big lightning strike that just shows how little they believed Mm -hmm. that this was actually going to happen i'm sorry what year was this 1981 Mm. i think so yeah oh that's gonna wake him up you can like feel it. Feel him waking up? No, the thunder. Oh, <laughs> I was like, you know, sometimes I do. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night, like, why am I awake? And then he starts crying, and I'm like, oh, damn you. Damn mother's intuition. Yeah. You always gotta be bright. That's um, also something very interesting. Yeah, it is. And they've done studies that show that, um, like, the baby's cells long after they're born are still in the mother's brain and that's where they believe mother's intuition comes from interesting somehow whoever was responsible for leroy's murder managed to come back to the scene of the crime without being spotted by anyone that spooks me out what do you do you have just like a backpack like yeah i don't know like what do you i I don't know i don't know how that would work (sighs) i don't know either they probably went back in the middle of the night. I don't know. They were probably staking the place out too, waiting well, for the best time or, to. Yeah, like part of their cult. It's like yeah, or they have them, people yeah. watching to let them know when the mm-hmm. time is right. So yeah, somehow somebody sneaks back in there without being spotted, and now with the return of Leroy's head to the crime scene, and just as Sandy had predicted. The ritual was now complete. So, unfortunately, because no one had been staking out the crime scene on the 42nd day, they had nothing. All they had now was Leroy's severed head, but no further evidence was left behind from what they already had. Sandy later admitted that she regrets not following her gut feeling and not trusting herself with this information. That sucks. That would would feel like the biggest regret of someone's life. 
You had the chance to solve a murder and I mean it's not her fault. No, obviously absolutely not, right? But, but that I would just, just be can't such imagine a shitty feeling. feeling. Right. Because like, I don't know, random stuff that happens to me, because like I, I usually really try to listen to my gut. And mm -hmm. sometimes I'm like, oh, no. And then bad shit happens, not like <laughs> that that kind of situation, it's, but it's still like, why like my body's telling me something. Yeah. Why did I not listen? It's hard, though. It's hard, like, distinguishing what's your intuition and what's Anxiety. just your... In exactly. Mm -hmm. Takes practice. Mm -hmm. So, now because of Sandy's theory being proven correctly, they begin looking into the murder from the angle of human sacrifice, like she had proposed a month earlier. But at this point, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Whoever did this had slipped through the grasp of their hands and... It's so frustrating because they could have had it in the bag. But I thought it was interesting, too, that Sandy went on to give a later interview where she said that she no longer believed that his murder was associated with Santeria, but was instead performed by a cult known as Palo Mayombi. I've not heard this part. Yeah, so that was the cult behind the murder of Mark Kilroy. Oh. And, like, 15 other people. Because oh when word. they went out and found Mark's body, they found the graves right. of so many more. Right. And his death was very similar to Leroy's. Mm -hmm. But it's just one of those things. I mean, this is the early 80s. Satanic panic was right around the corner. And, unfortunately, at that time, there just wasn't a lot known about occult practices. I think it just seems so, like... It only happens in faraway places. Not here in right. Main and Street, USA. Exactly. So it's just either like no one believed that occult practices were still a thing. Like it's a thing of the past. That's just something our ancestors did or hundreds of years ago. In other. Or. Right. Exactly. Always out of the world. Kind right. Of thing. Right. Yeah. You kind of had to be like a radical thinker to believe that. Someone's death in San Francisco, of all places, could be the works of some cultish sacrifice. I say that, and I'm like, hmm, San Francisco, you see? Well, you a lot of shit can go down there. <laughs> there have actually been, like, a lot of yeah. cults yes. out of California. I know, that's what I'm saying. Somebody, California, are you okay? Yeah, somebody needs to look into that. What's going on? I think it's just because it's so big. And there's a lot of space to, like, do your own thing. And Texas is big, too. Yeah, but there's a bunch of guns in Texas. Mark Kilroy went... <laughs> Mark Kilroy went missing out of Texas, though. How interesting. But he was there for spring break. It was, like, right on the border. And he was taken to Mexico. Oh. Yeah, people have done a lot of weird things in the name of the occult. Yeah, I guess so. You really have to wonder, like, do people actually believe in this? Like, do they just do it because they have too much time, energy on their hands? Well, and, and money. Mm. Money. Yeah. Mm. I mean, think about it. We know about, like, real life secret societies. Okay, but, like, if we know about them, so are they actually secret? Well, no, but... You know what I mean? We have the Freemasons, the Old Fellows, the Hellfire Club. Mm, right. So, Ben Franklin, <laughs> Hellfire Club. Okay, yeah, money, I see it. Too much of it. And suddenly, you're trying to summon the devil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, there was actually recent news in the land of real-life millionaire occultists. What? Yeah, so there's this guy, old, rich, white guy, of course. Surprise. No way. <laughs> yeah. And for, like, decades, his name would pop up in, like, different paranormal circles, putting out feelers for weird artifacts, hosting wild parties for, like, psychics and stuff, and sometimes showing up at conventions to sit on panels. So normal, too much money stuff? Yeah, except, like, I guess he was known to hold secret rituals and stuff. Known to? 
Well, rumor to. Okay, uh, what's his name? His name was Mortimer Montgomery. Was? Yeah, he's dead. Sad? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't really, like, do anything bad, I guess. So, yeah, but listen to this. Okay, I'm listening. So, his mansion burned down, the whole thing, in total rubble. Was anyone hurt? Well, that's the thing. According to his security, he did it himself. Like, he had them all leave, told them exactly what he was doing, and then he told them to call authorities, like, exactly ten minutes after they saw the flames. And they did it? Sounds fairly legal. They did, but I guess, I mean, I guess they're paid pretty well. That checks out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this old creepy mansion burns the whole thing, except for one circle. Okay. Like, it's a perfect circle, eight foot wide, right in the foyer, or what used to be the foyer, and it's completely unburned. Weird. Was there, like, something there covering it? So it was it burned? Well, there was nothing there that would, like, keep it from burning, but they did find something, or, like, some things. There were two people in a skull. Okay. Yeah, so they have two survivors, an unidentified woman, and a guy who is apparently Mortimer's son. He he tried to kill his son? Well, I guess apparently, like, no one knew about the son. Mortimer had all sorts of legal stipulations as if he was preparing for an heir to pop up out of nowhere. But no one knew about the son, and he was just found. In this circle, in this burned down rubble of a mansion. That's bonkers. Yeah, totally. And there there was a skull? Yeah, so the skull, it was actually the charred head of Mortimer. What the fuck? Yeah, so this dude left all sorts of info for his lawyers and security, basically being like, I did this. This was not murder. I'm responsible. Nobody else. And that's it. People are... People are buying it. Well, yeah, I mean, he's super rich, so... Mm. Yes. And you said there was the woman? Yeah, no one really knows anything about her, but there's some rumors that are saying she's still in the hospital in a coma, but I really haven't found anything else on her. But she apparently was also found in that circle completely unharmed. So. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah. If you hear any Google alerts, <laughs> let me know. Yeah, I'll uh, <laughs> definitely keep an eye out. But that is it for today. Oh, man. Okay. So thank you all so much for being here. And remember to always, always keep, keep it spooky. spooky. The Deepman Files is a creative alternate reality podcast. To hear the rest of Mortimer Montgomery's story, find The Deepman Files, available on all streaming platforms.